In this video, we're going to be covering the deep sural muscles. These are muscles of the posterior compartment of the lower leg that lie deep to the gastrocnemius and the soleus, and technically also the tendon of plantaris. So if we look here at this picture on the left, this diamond-shaped structure up here, this would be the popliteal fossa, and beneath that we have the gastrocnemius. Right here would be the lateral head of gastrocnemius. This is the medial head. Remember that the lateral head doesn't go up as far proximally, so this slightly darker red colored muscle here, this is actually the muscle belly of plantaris that lies above that of the lateral head of the gastroc. Now obviously gastrocnemius has been cut here from the Achilles tendon, and so we can see the underlying soleus muscle which lies deep to the gastroc. And then here we see the tendon of plantaris coming down from its muscle belly. It's a very long, thin tendon that runs down here and eventually merges with the Achilles tendon. In fact, the plantaris tendon, as it goes underneath the main part of this Achilles tendon, actually separates the soleus from the Achilles tendon. It actually lies in between. And then if we remove the plantaris tendon and the soleus muscle, we can now see these deep sural muscles. And there's actually four of these that we care about. This one up at the top, this is the popliteus. And then we have the flexor hallucis longus, the tibialis posterior, and the flexor digitorum longus, which is the first one that we're going to look at. So the origin of flexor digitorum longus, or FDL, is on the posterior tibia, specifically at a region inferior to the soleal line. We can see the flexor digitorum longus over here in this other picture, and if you look right there on the tibia, you can see this little bony part that actually separates the popliteus in green from these other muscles beneath it. This right here is actually the soleal line. That actually constitutes part of the origin of the soleus muscle, and so you can see that the flexor digitorum longus actually originates below that or inferior to that. And then if we follow the muscle belly down, we see that the tendon actually goes through the tarsal tunnel across the medial aspect of the ankle joint and then goes underneath the foot where the tendon then divides into four separate tendons that go to digits two, three, four, and five, specifically to the basis of the distal phalanges of digits two through five. So being that the flexor digitorum longus inserts on the distal phalanges, we know that it can have some effects on the distal interphalangeal joint the proximal interphalangeal joint, and a little bit on the metatarsophalangeal joint. That being said, the actions of flexor digitorum longus include metatarsophalangeal, so MTP, and interphalangeal flexion, specifically with respect to digits 2, 3, 4, and 5. So when you perform toe grabs to pick up an object like a marble, you're using the flexor digitorum longus in addition to the flexor digitorum previs, which is actually an intrinsic muscle of the plantar surface of the foot. We'll be covering that in another video. Additionally, flexor digitorum longus can assist with plantar flexion and also subtalar inversion. Now, being that this muscle is in the posterior compartment of the lower leg, it's innervated by the tibial nerve, as all the other muscles are. Specifically, the nerve roots that contribute are L5, S1, and S2 and the blood supply to FDL is via the posterior tibial artery. Next, we'll be covering the flexor hallucis longus, which you can see right here. Notice that the flexor hallucis longus and flexor digitorum longus actually flank the muscle belly of tibialis posterior on either side. This muscle we'll be getting to next. Here's another look at flexor hallucis longus over here. If you look over here on the picture, you can actually see the head of the fibula, and then the shaft of the fibula going down. So the origin of flexor hallucis longus is going to include the distal two-thirds of the posterior fibula, right down here. Also some on the inner osseous membrane, that's that syndesmosis, dense fibrous connective tissue between the fibula and the tibia, similar to what you have in the forearm between the radius and ulna. Also some of the origin is on the posterior intermuscular septum of the leg, and also some connecting with the fascia of the tibialis posterior muscle, which you can't actually see here in the picture. If we follow the muscle down, it eventually comes down to a tendon, which also goes across the tarsal tunnel, across the medial aspect of the ankle joint, and eventually goes underneath the foot, where the tendon goes to the distal phalanx 
of the great toe. So that's the insertion. And being that it inserts on the distal phallus of the great toe, it's going to be able to participate in both MTP and interphalangeal flexion of the hallux or the great toe. It's also going to be able to participate in plantar flexion and subtalar inversion, just like we saw for the flexor digitorum longus. The innervation of flexor hallucis longus is via the tibial nerve, and specifically it gets nerve root contributions from S2 and S3, which notice is different than flexor digitorum longus, which is L5 through S2. The blood supply to flexor hallucis longus is posterior tibial artery, but it also gets some from the fibular artery by virtue that the muscle belly is so close to the lateral leg compartment where the fibularis muscles reside. The digital flexors are pretty straightforward to strengthen. You just utilize that movement, digital flexion or toe flexion. And one example of an exercise that can be used is this one, which is marble pickups. Now, there's a lot of variations in how you can do this, but here's a really good one. You just lay out a towel, and you have some number of marbles. Here's 10 of them. And I'm going to use one of my feet, my right foot right here, to grab the marbles and then drop them in the cup right here. And you can even measure the time it takes to put all of these marbles in the cup and use that as an objective measure going forward. Now, this exercise is almost always done in seated. The patient will be sitting on the edge of the chair or the edge of a table, and they'll use one of their feet, preferably barefoot, to put the marbles in the cup. You can do it in standing, but when you're standing, that adds an extra layer, and that's balance on the lower extremity that's not picking up the marbles. So obviously, when I pick up the marbles with my right foot, my right foot's in the air, and so I'm going to be in single leg support on the left. You can do that, but it makes it much more complicated. And so that's why it's typically done in seated, because you're looking at strengthening a muscle. So take balance out of the equation. It allows them to focus more on that strengthening. And so the gist is, obviously, you're going to pick the marbles up with your feet and drop them in the cup, as you see right there. And so you're grasping the marble with toe flexion, and you can also cue the patient to release the marble into the cup with toe extension. Sometimes that can make it a little bit easier for them. Obviously, smaller marbles weigh less. They take up a smaller volume, and so they're going to be easier to pick up. And then larger marbles are going to be more difficult because the marble occupies a greater volume and it weighs more. Now, one important note here on the marble pickups. These are not good for strengthening the intrinsic foot muscles. So if somebody has pes planus, so they have a collapsed arch, and it's causing them problems, well, you want to strengthen the foot intrinsic to try and reduce the degree of collapse in that arch, even potentially raise the arch a little bit more, make it closer to normal. But this exercise is not good for that. If you want to actually strengthen the foot intrinsics, you actually need to do the foot shortening exercise, which we're going to be covering much later on in another video. This one is specific for the digital flexors. And then some other methods that you see there for strengthening these muscles would be simple active range of motion with squeezes. So you start off with more toe extension, and then you go through toe flexion, active range of motion, and at the end range, squeeze and hold that squeeze for a couple of seconds and then relax. Go back to toe extension and keep going back and forth. Another thing you can also do, it gets you a little bit more motor control as well, is to take a towel that's already folded out like this one and grab the edges with your toes and kind of fold it in and crumple it. And then once it's crumpled up, re-unfold it back to its original rectangular shape, as you see right there. And then sandwiched between the flexor digitorum longus and the flexor hallucis longus is the muscle belly of the tibialis posterior muscle, sometimes abbreviated the posterior tib. It has origins on both these bones here. So on the posterior surface of the tibia, the posterior surface of the fibula, which you can kind of see right there, and then also on the interosseous membrane between them. And if we follow the muscle belly down, it also goes down to a tendon, which you can't really see right here because it's so deep. But the tendon also goes across that tarsal tunnel, across the medial aspect of the ankle, and that tendon goes to insert on a variety of bones in the foot. Those would be the navicular tuberosity, all three cuneiform bones, the cuboid, and the bases of metatarsals 2, 3, and 4. The actions of tibialis posterior would include subtalar inversion and plantar flexion of the ankle joint. 
There's a number of muscles that contribute to subtalar inversion, but this is the major subtalar inverter and therefore supinator of the foot. That being said, the tibialis posterior participates in foot supination during pre-swing of gait and at the end of terminal stance in gait. And it also helps support the medial longitudinal arch of the foot. Sure, you can have somebody with very strong posterior tibs, five out of five muscle strength, that just happens to be born with genetically flat feet. However, if you have somebody that starts off with a normal arch and they start to develop progressively weaker and weaker tibialis posteriors, then their arch is gonna to begin to collapse over time. So here's my setup to strengthen the subtalar inverters, in particular tibialis posterior. I've got a closed loop TheraBand here. One end of it's around something sturdy like the leg of a table, and the other end is wrapped around my foot, as you can see right here. Now, I don't need to begin in a position of subtalar eversion, and that's because inversion has a pretty sizable range of motion. Normal range of motion is about 50 degrees, so I can start here in approximately subtalar joint neutral, like you see. And then all I'm going to do is contract the subtalar inverters and try to put the plantar surface of my foot a little bit more towards my midline, okay? So it'll look something like this. So there's that. Notice the plantar surface of my foot goes more towards the midline there. You'll also notice that when I do this movement, I'm plantar flexing. Remember that one of the actions of tibialis posterior is to act as a plantar flexor in addition to a subtalar inverter. I can also take this out a little bit more to give more resistance. But either way, I'm pointing the plantar surface toward my midline, just like that. If you find that the TheraBand slides a little bit too much, then you can always put on a pair of shoes. And again, the bottom of the shoes creates some friction that prevents the sliding of that TheraBand. And you'll also notice that when I contract the muscles, I hold for a couple of seconds before releasing it back. The second exercise we're gonna look at is a variation of the heel raise, but it has a subtalar inversion bias. So what you're looking at right here in the video is just a normal heel raise, just closed chain plantar flexion. And what you actually see is there's a normal toe out angle. On average, it's about seven degrees per foot. I have a little bit extra here. Again, it's just some point on the bell curve, right? And then if you wanna bias the tibialis posterior, you do that. You intentionally turn the toes inward and perform the same heel raise. This increases the use of tibialis posterior you're still going to be using the gastrocnemius and the soleus to perform this plantar flexion, but you're gonna increase the percent contribution of tibialis posterior. And so, therefore, this is a really good way to strengthen the muscle in the closed chain. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.